There was a young man by the name of Tom that was out selling religious books. Tom was a call porter. And he, as he was going from door to door, he came by a house that looked particularly dilapidated. It didn't look like anybody could live in this house. And so he was tempted to keep on going. But what are all call porters told to do? Does anybody know? You go knock on every door. So even though he didn't feel like it, he went down to what looked like a deserted house and knocked on the door. And pretty soon he hears rustling around inside and an old man comes to the door holding a cane. And he says, what do you want? And Tom explained his canvas that he was out selling religious material to earn a scholarship. And when the old man heard religious, he says, I want nothing to do with religion. I don't have God in my life now and I don't want to. And Tom was taken back by how strong the man came across to him. And Tom started saying, well, sir, we're not trying to force our religion on anybody. Unfortunately, it was the wrong choice of words. And the man says, did you say force? And he took his cane and he shook it in the boy's face. And he says, you better not try to force anything on me. Get off my property. So Tom, taken back, turned and sadly walked away. Well, he noticed that it was getting dark and he hurried back to the home where he was staying because it was going to rain. And that night it did rain and a warning went out to the city. Those who lived near the river go inland because the river is going to flood tonight. And sure enough, the rains came down and the floods came up. However, the old man lived next to the river and he didn't get the warning. So as the floods came up, the old man had gone to bed and he was sleeping soundly and the flood waters came into his living room and pretty soon his furniture started floating around, but the old man slept on. Pretty soon his bed started floating around with him on it, but the old man slept on. Finally, sometime before morning, he awoke to find his nose about six inches from the ceiling. And realizing his predicament, he started screaming for help, but there was nobody to hear him. In time, people in the town remembered, now there's an old man down by the river. I wonder if he got the message. We better go check. So they took a boat, because that's what they needed by this time, and they took it down to the old man's house where the roof was sticking out above the water. And they got on the roof and they could hear the old man crying inside, so they cut a hole in the roof, reached down, pulled him out, and took him to the hospital. Now, Tom had a custom that he would go to the local hospital in the evenings and pray with people. And this particular evening was no different. He went to the hospital and he prayed with different people. And as he's getting ready to leave, he asks the nurse, he says, is there anybody else here I should pray with, I could pray with? And she says, well, there is one old man, but he seems like a hopeless case. And Tom says, don't say that, I'll be glad to go pray with him. So she told him where to go. And as he's walking down to the, to the room that he's supposed to go to, he hears a voice in the room crying out. And the voice is crying out, Oh God, help me. I don't want to go to hell. Oh God, help me. I don't want to go to hell. And so Tom opens the door, and to his surprise, it's the same old man who had chased him off his property. And Tom rushes over to the old man, and starts explaining the love and forgiveness of God. But the old man keeps saying the same words over and over and over. Oh Jesus, save me. I don't want to go to hell. I don't want to go to hell. I don't want to go to hell. Tom finally realizes the old man isn't hearing anything he's saying. So he sadly turns and he walks away as the old man continues to stare at the ceiling and say the same words over and over and over and over. That night, the old man died. He died in shock and despair that he had cut himself off from God. You see, the Lord had sent light to the old man's home, but he had rejected the light one too many times. It is very fearful words the words, too late, when it is too late. However, there's a story in Scripture about some young ladies that found out that it was too late. And we want to look at that story briefly this morning. Matthew 25, verse 1. 
And we're going to move through quickly because we have a lot of material to cover in a short time. So we're going to, I'm going to talk fast. Then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened unto ten virgins, which took their lamps and went forth to meet the bridegroom. And five of them were wise and five were foolish. Now, in <clears throat> weddings in the, in the time of Christ, oftentimes you would have two parties, the bride's party and the groom's party. And the groom or the bridegroom would leave his father's house, go to where the bridal party was, get his bride, and return to his father's house for the wedding feast. And these ten young ladies are part of the bride's party. They are waiting for the bridegroom. They think they are ready, all right? And of course, we can see the spiritual symbolism where the bridegroom is going for his bride and taking her back to his father's house for the wedding. All right. They that were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them, but the wise took oils in their vessels with their lamps. And while the bridegroom tarried, they all slumbered and slept. They all slumbered and slept. From Manuscript 144, 1898, we read, The parable of the ten virgins is given to represent the church, those who are watching for their Lord's appearing, those who are seeking most earnestly to be among that number who will be acknowledged as the Lamb's wife. So when we look at the parable of the ten virgins, the parable is not about the church and the world, it's about the church and the church, the good and the bad within the church. And at midnight there was a cry made, Behold, the bridegroom cometh, go ye out to meet him. Now we notice that this was a loud cry, and it was a midnight cry. Do you understand the symbolism there? It was a loud cry, and it was a midnight cry, and the cry said, Behold, the bridegroom cometh. Now the bridegroom hadn't come yet. This was the loud cry or the midnight cry that preceded the coming of the bridegroom. The wake up cry that says, this is it. This is really it. Then those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said unto the wise, give us of your oil for our lamps are gone out. But the wise answered saying, not so, lest there be not enough for us and for you. But go ye rather to them that sell and buy for yourselves. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came. Now, and they that were ready went in with him to the marriage, and the door was shut. So let's ask a question here. When the cry went forth and the ten virgins woke up, was there still time for the foolish virgins to go out and buy oil? There was no time, was there? All right. Now, I want to pause at this story, and we want to jump to a story in the Old Testament, a story that also has to do with oil. It's a story of prophet Elisha and a woman coming to him whose husband had died, and she says, the creditors are coming to take my children. That's what happened in those days. If you didn't pay your debts, they would take your children. So she says, the creditors are coming to take my children, and you know my husband served the Lord. And in 2 Kings chapter 4 and verse 2, it says, and Elisha said unto her, What shall I do for you? Tell me, what do you have in your house? And she said, Your handmaid has not anything in the house save a pot of oil. Then he said, Go, borrow thee vessels abroad of all thy neighbors, even empty vessels, borrow not a few. And when thou art come in, thou shalt shut the door upon thee and upon thy sons, and thou shalt pour into all those vessels, and thou shalt set aside that which is full. So she went from him and shut the door upon her and upon her sons, who brought the vessels to her, and she poured out. And it came to pass, when the vessels were full, that she said unto her son, Bring me yet a vessel. And he said unto her, There is not a vessel more. And the oil stayed. Then she came and told the man of God, and he said, Go, sell the oil, and pay thy debt, and live thou and thy children on the rest. In Scripture, what does oil represent? Holy Spirit. And what do vessels represent? People, 2 Corinthians 4, 7. We have this treasure in earthen vessels. What was the widow told to do before she started pouring the oil into the vessels? She was told to shut the door. Now, when the widow started pouring oil into the vessels, was there still time to bring in more empty vessels? 
No. Why? Because the door was shut. Is there a significance there? Is there a time coming when the loud cry sounds forth? And those of the church that are ready and receive the latter rain go into the heavenly kingdom, but those who are unready and who do not receive the latter rain find it is too late and they do not go into the heavenly kingdom. Is there a time of division coming where God's people who did not accept the message, yea, rejected the message. Maybe they attended church. Maybe they paid their tithe. Maybe they didn't work on Sabbath, but in their hearts they had no connection with God. They rejected the connection because their hearts were more set on the things of the world. Is there a time coming when those individuals will wake up only to realize it is too late? You know, the Bible says in Jeremiah 8.20, the harvest is past, the summer has ended, and we are not saved. Very solemn words from the book of Jeremiah. In verse 11 of Matthew 25, it says, Afterwards came also the other virgins, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered and said, Verily I say unto you, I know you not. What was the problem here? The problem wasn't that they didn't go to church on the right day, that they didn't pay their tithe, they didn't keep the Sabbath, they didn't eat the wrong things they shouldn't eat. The problem was... I don't know you. They didn't have a living connection with Christ. We can do all the things we're supposed to do, and those are great things to do, and we shouldn't not do them. But if we do them, but we miss the most important thing, the living connection, it's all for naught. The connection is the message God is trying to get to his people's hearts, that he wants to connect with us, to talk with us, for us to talk to him. Because we can't be saved through our spouse, our parents, our children, we're saved individually as we know Christ for ourselves. Matthew 7, 21 says, Not everyone that says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he that does the will of my Father which is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name, and in thy name have cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works. And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. So what was the issue here? And what was the issue with the five foolish virgins? I don't know you. I don't know you. And the question God's people must ask today, do I know the Lord? You know the word know or knew in Scripture often denotes the intimacy between a husband and a wife, between spouses. The same word also denotes spirit, the type of spiritual intimacy God wants to have with us, where we know him at the heart level and he knows us, and we're connected spiritually to him. That's the kind of relationship God wants to have, and that's the kind of relationship that is necessary to go through the times ahead. Jesus says in Jeremiah 29, 13, And ye shall seek me and find me when ye shall search for me with all your heart. Oftentimes, God's people don't search with all the heart. They go through a superficial experience. They sit in the church pew. They give their tithe. They do all the things, but they haven't given him all the heart. And Jesus is saying, I want all the heart. After all, when two people get married... How can they be really married unless they're really fully given to each other? You can't have a marriage relationship and hold on to that old boyfriend or girlfriend. Doesn't work, does it, folks? You have to have total commitment. And here Christ is saying that. All right. Review in Herald, August 19, 1890 says, I am often referred to the parable of the ten virgins, five of whom were wise and five foolish. This parable has been and will be fulfilled to the very letter, for it has a special application to this time. So we see the parable of the ten virgins is a parable that is symbolic of last day events, God's church at the end of time. Bible Commentary, volume 7, page 983 says, when the earth is lighted with the glory of the angel of Revelation 18. Now, what is the message of the angel of Revelation 18? Sometimes do we refer to it as the loud cry? 
the loud cry. The religious elements, not the world, the religious elements, both good and evil, awake. They wake up from their slumber, and the armies of the living God will take the field. When does this happen? When the earth is lighted with the glory of the angel of Revelation 18. So we have the parable of the ten virgins representing God's church at the end. The midnight cry of the bridegroom represents the time of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit or the latter rain, the loud cry. Those of the church who are ready and who receive the latter rain go into the heavenly kingdom. Those who are unready will not go into the heavenly kingdom. See, there's a storm coming, brothers and sisters, a storm coming that people do not realize the implications of. And there's a sense of urgency to give a warning message. You know, in prior to World War II, the United States um, intelligence agencies cracked the code that the Japanese used for their diplomatic messages. And on the December 6, in the morning of December 7, 1941, uh, the U.S. intelligence intercepted the code that Japan was sending to its embassy in Washington that says, at 1 p.m. Washington time, break off diplomatic relations with the United States. From that intercepted message, the United States military presumed that Japan was going to attack the United States on the morning of December 7. Now, 1 p.m., Washington time was dawn in the Pacific. So the order was given, alert U.S. forces in the Pacific to be prepared for a possible Japanese attack at dawn on December 7, 1941. However, the message that was to be sent to Pearl Harbor didn't get sent by the regular military channels. It got sent by Western Union. And it arrived there at 11 a.m. in Hawaii time, on December 7, 1941, several hours after the attack on Pearl Harbor had already begun. The message that was to go out as a message of warning was not sent with a sense of urgency and therefore did no good. Is it possible at the end of time, God's people need to have a sense of urgency about giving the last day messages for this time? Because time is of essence. We must give the message. Looking in Zephaniah chapter 1, verse 14, it says, The great day of the Lord is near. It is near and hasteth greatly, even the voice of the day of the Lord. The mighty man shall cry there bitterly. The voice of the day of the Lord. The loud cry that the Lord is coming. That day is a day of wrath, a day of trouble and distress a day of wasteness and desolation, a day of darkness and gloominess, a day of clouds and thick darkness, a day of the trumpet and alarm against the fenced cities and against the high towers. Now I want you to carefully look at this next verse here. And I will bring distress upon men, now notice what the verse says, and they shall walk like blind men. Remember those words, we're going to see them again in a minute. Something very similar. Neither their silver nor their gold shall be able to, to deliver them in the day of the Lord's wrath. From Hosea, we read, chapter 5, verse 8 and 9, Blow ye the cornet in Gibeah, and the trumpet in Ramah. Among the tribes of Israel have I made known that which shall surely be. Once again, notice those words, that which shall surely be. We're going to see those words again here in just a moment. In Matthew 24, 15, Jesus warns of a time coming when people will have to flee the cities because of the desolation and destruction that are coming upon them. And in this text, in Matthew 24, 15, he says, When ye shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet stand in the holy place, whoso readeth, let him understand. Now, when Jesus gave this prophecy, it was a twofold prophecy. It referred to the destruction that would come upon Jerusalem, which happened in A.D. 70, when Rome came, the abomination of desolation was when the armies of Rome came and surrounded Jerusalem. And the Christians knew this is the sign we're supposed to leave. But they couldn't leave. And so then the armies of Rome withdrew and the Christians were able to make their escape. And then the armies of Rome returned and destroyed the city. Here in the abomination of desolation, 
Jesus then goes on and says, then let them which be in Judea flee into the mountains. Now, because Matthew 24 is a dual application chapter, the prophecy, we find that the abomination of desolation in the disciples' time was when the mark of pagan Rome came on holy ground. That was a sign desolation is about to happen. Likewise, at the end of time, you have the last day application of that verse, those verses. And as pagan Rome was succeeded by papal Rome, at the end of time, you have the mark of papal Rome coming on holy ground or upon that country or nation which is foremost at the end of the time end of time responsible for the spreading of the gospel message when the mark of papal rome comes to that land know that desolation is near now i don't have time in this morning's message to talk about everything surrounding the abomination of desolation and what the mark means but from our last camp we had two presentations one on um, America, the Pope and prophecy, and the other on the parable of the fig tree or signs of the end. And if you want to get, you're welcome to get those from Autumn Leaves to have more of a study on this chapter. Now, that prophecy has not been fulfilled yet, but we know it's coming shortly. When God issues judgments, do they come quickly? Do they come? Yes, they do. So let's look at some biblical examples of this. At the time of the flood, God gave a warning message through Noah. It was a warning message of judgments to come to a perverse and violent world steeped in the love of self. It was a message with the offer of salvation to all who were willing to accept it, but for those who rejected it, it was a message of judgment. Now, do you ever wonder what would have happened if more people would have wanted to go on the ark than what the ark would have filled? God wouldn't have needed to send a flood. Just like when Abraham says, Lord, if there's 10 people in Sodom, would you destroy it? And he says, no. But there wasn't. The ark could have filled many more people than the eight that went on it. So the message of salvation that God offered to the world was rejected. And when it was rejected, judgment fell. Likewise, Lot was told in Genesis 19, 17, Escape for thy life, lest thou be consumed. In the days of Sodom and Gomorrah, a message of warning and judgment was given. This same message of warning that Lot went out and he gave to his daughters and his son-in-laws. And they laughed at him. They said, oh, that's ridiculous. You know, Dad, we don't see anything happening right now. But if we see something, then we'll, we'll, we'll act. Then we'll get out. But right now, we don't see anything. Well, brothers and sisters, if you wait until the crisis, it's going to be too late. Just like in the flood, if the people may have, may have said, you know, I don't want to get on Noah's boat now, but if it starts raining, I'll get on. Well, if you wait until the rain starts, it's too late. You've got to be ready before the crisis comes, because in the crisis, you can't get ready. In Genesis 19, 24, the Bible says, Then the Lord rained upon Sodom and upon Gomorrah brimstone and fire from the Lord out of heaven. Now, Review and Herald, November 13, 1913, says this, But like the dwellers in Sodom, those who refuse to serve God will be awakened only when it is too late. As the sun arose for the last time upon the cities of the plain, the people thought to begin another day of godless riot. All were eagerly planning their business or their pleasure, and the messenger of God was derided for his fears and his warnings. Suddenly, as a peal of thunder from an unclouded sky fell balls of fire on the doomed capital. How did God bring judgment on Sodom and Gomorrah? How did he bring judgment? Balls of fire fell upon the doomed capital. Likewise, in the days of the prophet Jeremiah, God gave a warning to his chosen people, a people who tried to display a form of godliness, but again were steeped in violence, perversion, and self-worship. Yet in the end, after repeating warnings of judgment and destruction, the very same came upon Jerusalem and the cities of Judea. Warning the people against rebellion and of coming destruction, the Lord declared by the prophet Jeremiah, but if you will not hearken unto me to hallow the Sabbath day. What is the issue in the text? The Sabbath day. Then will I kindle a fire in the gates thereof, 
and it shall devour the palaces of Jerusalem, and it shall not be quenched. Now, who lives in palaces? Kings, rich, royalty, the well-to-do, right? And here the Lord is saying that the issue is the Sabbath, and that as a result, judgment falls upon the wicked on their palaces, and it's in fire, and it's fire that cannot be quenched. Hosea 8.14 says, For Israel has forgotten his maker and buildeth temples. What kind of temples do you think Israel built? Were they to the Lord? No, they were idol temples. And Judah has multiplied fenced cities, but I will send a fire upon his cities, and it shall devour what? The palaces thereof. If you look in the Old Testament, you find this a very similar phrase to this, that God sends judgment of fire upon the palaces over and over and over in the Old Testament. And we notice the palaces are symbolize those who have the most means and opportunity to make a difference in this life. Jeremiah 6.19 says, Hear, O earth, behold, I will bring evil upon this people, even the fruit of their thoughts, because they have not hearkened unto my words, nor unto my law, but rejected it. Now here, who is the Lord talking to? Is he talking to the Jews? He says, Hear, O earth, He's talking to the earth, all right? And he says, is there a time coming when the earth rejects what? The law of God. And as a result, God brings judgment upon the earth. Is there a time coming when the earth rejects the law of God? And as a result, God brings judgments upon the earth. When do the judgments of God start in earnest? Joel 2.23 be glad then, ye children of Zion, and rejoice in the Lord your God, for he hath given you the former rain moderately, and he will cause, cause to come down for you the rain, the former rain and the latter rain. And of course, we know what the former and the latter rain refer to. The outpouring of the rain, the former and latter rain, is the outpouring of the Spirit upon God's church. The former rain was the outpouring of the Spirit at the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2. The latter rain is the outpouring of the Spirit upon God's end-time church. It's that time, the latter rain, when the loud cry is given. When the, revelation, the message of the, revelation, of the angel of Revelation 18 is brought forth. And also upon the servants and upon the handmaids in those days will I pour out my spirit. And I will show wonders in the heavens and in the earth. Blood and fire and pillars of smoke. Well, that sounds like judgment language. Is it possible then that during the time of the loud cry and the latter rain is also the time that the judgments of God start, but judgments mixed with mercy? That's interesting. Ellen White had two very distinct dreams of the judgments of God falling upon the cities in terms of fire from heaven. One dream was in 1904, and the second one was in 1906. And during her life, time, and Subsequently, a number of, the, of her dreams were released over time, uh, recounting, these two, re, recounting these two dreams. However, some of them were only released in 2015. So we're going to take just a minute and we're going to look at these dreams and look at the picture that is presented in these two dreams. So the first dream was the one in 1904, and here we find it in letter 217. It's also recorded in nine testimonies. Let's look at it. It says, the night before last, a very impressive scene passed before me. I saw an immense ball of fire. Now, when you see that, how many balls of fire did she see? One. Fall into the midst of some beautiful mansions, causing their instant destruction. Where did the ball of fire fall? Did it fall where the poor people live? It fell in the palaces, didn't it? Okay. I heard some say, we knew that the judgments of God were coming upon the earth, but we did not know they would come so soon. Others said, you knew. Why did you not tell us? We did not know. On every side, I heard such words spoken. She went back to sleep and she dreamed again. And she said, then I saw jets of light shining from cities and villages and from the high places and the low places of the earth. God's word was obeyed, and as a result, there were memorials for him in every city and village. His truth was proclaimed throughout the world. 
When will we see memorials for God in every city and village? At the time of the loud cry and of the latter rain. I'm going to jump to the 1906 dream now. And she says, In the night season I had a presentation. I saw the whole heavens lighted up. There were balls that looked like fire falling, and these balls looked as if full of arrows. And wherever they struck, there were great calamities. Houses were set on fire, and no human effort could extinguish the flame. Did we read something like that in Jeremiah? The flame cannot be quenched. The earth quaked, and homes were falling with a crash. I heard the distressing screeching and praying. There was confusion everywhere. I said to someone. Now this next part is very, very interesting and very telling. Do look, this is the most striking representation of what will be in the last day. Revelation 18. What's Revelation 18 about? Sins of Babylon and the loud cry message. Voices were proclaiming the events taking place. Read and understand, for it will surely be. Chapter 19 of Revelation will ere long be fulfilled. Revelation 21. There are voices proclaiming the words of these chapters. With great power was the message given. All right, so look at this. You have this terrible destruction coming upon cities, multiple cities, that she's told this, is, this will surely be. But it comes at a time when she says the messages of Revelation 18, 19, and 21 are being proclaimed loudly. Well, there's no message proclaimed after the close of probation, is there? This is during the loud cry and the latter rain, when destruction has gone forth upon the cities. The word of the Lord will be fulfilled. So there's a time coming when the judgments of God begin to be poured upon the cities. It is a time of judgment mixed with mercy. It is during the time of the latter rain and the loud cry. All right, going on, manuscript 154, 1904. While I was in Nashville, a scene was opened before me. A great ball of fire, notice there's just one ball of fire in the 1904 dream, seemed to fall from heaven, and from it went forth flashes of light. When these flashes of light would strike a building, the building would burn like tinder, and then I heard someone say, I knew that this was coming. These are the judgments of God I knew were coming. You knew, said another, you were my neighbor. Why did you not tell me these things were coming? Why did you not warn others? If you knew this was going to happen, why didn't you share the prophecy with me? I was your neighbor. You never told me. I was the person down the street. I was the clerk at the grocery store. Why didn't you share with me that the Lord was coming? In the 1904 dream, there's two groups of people over and over you find repeated in this dream. And she identifies who one of the groups is. Now, one group says, I knew this was going to happen. And the other group says, if you knew, why didn't you tell me? Manuscript 188, 1905. While I was at Nashville, I had been speaking to the people. And in the night season, there was an immense ball of fire that came right from heaven and settled in Nashville. So here she says where the ball of fire comes down at. There were flames going out like arrows from that ball. Houses were being consumed. Houses were tottering and falling. Some of our people were standing there. It is just as we expected, they said. We expected this. Others were wringing their hands in agony and crying unto God for mercy. You knew it, said they. You knew that this was coming and never said a word to warn us. They seemed as though they would almost tear them to pieces to think they had never told them or given them any warning at all. Now, it's interesting, in Testimonies, Volume 9, some of you are familiar with this book, and there's in the first chapter, Ellen White had a dream about New York, and she gives the description that many people um, attribute to 9-11, and this presentation isn't to argue that point one way or the other, except to say that God gave Ellen White a dream about what would come upon New York while she was in New York. That's when she had the dream of what would come upon New York. Likewise, it's very interesting that God gave Ellen White a dream of what would come upon Nashville while she was in Nashville. Where she was at is where God gave her the dreams of this is what will happen. 
There was a scene presented to me. It was the night before the Sabbath. That is when the scene was presented. I looked out of the window and there was an immense ball of fire that had come from heaven and it fell where they were casting buildings with pillars. Especially the pillars were presented to me and it seemed as if the ball came right to the building and crushed it. And they saw that it was branching out, branching out, enlarging. And they began to cry and mourn and mourn and wring their hands. And I thought some of our people stood by there saying, well, it is just what we have been expecting. Haven't they been saying that all the way along? We've been expecting this. But now she says something different. In fact, she says, it is just what we have been talking about. And she repeats it a second time. It is just what we have been talking about. You knew it, said the people. You knew it and never told us about it. I thought there was such an agony in their face, such an agony in their appearance. Late 2015, ISIS attacked Paris. You may remember. And where the most carnage happened was at the auditorium where there was a heavy metal group, angels of, eagles of death metal, singing a song. And the song they were singing was Kiss the Devil. And you can see in the, the closed circuit TV cameras, you can see the, the rock band up there and the crowd waving the two horn sign of the devil, the occultic sign of the devil, singing Kiss the Devil. And ISIS then broke in. And this is where the most carnage happened in the Paris attacks. And we ask the question, is there a link between society turning from God and embracing Satan and the level of judgment that falls upon that society? I remember on or about September 10, 2001, Larry King, you all know who Larry King is. Larry King from CNN, all right? American news source, Larry King, famous um, talk show host. So Larry King says, tonight on CNN, we are having a live seance from New York City. Tonight on CNN, a live seance from New York City. The next morning was 9-11. Where was the most carnage? It was New York City. Is there any link between society turning from God and embracing Satan and the level of judgment that falls upon society? Ellen White talked about the ball of fire falling on a building of with pillars in Nashville. The most prominent pillared building probably is the Nashville Parthenon, which is an exact replica of an ancient pagan temple, complete with an ancient pagan god on the inside. We visited there last summer. It is full of symbols of the occult on the inside. It's kind of interesting down there that there is a um, group that puts on a Nashville Pagan Day every year, and it, they collect money for the food kitchen and, and that sort of nice thing, but they're a group of witches and they have their own website, and they're the most evil-looking people I've ever seen in my life. And they're very bold about it. They're witches, but it's kind of like a renaissance. You know, they invite the people out, come out. You know, Satan likes to mix uh, a lot of good with a little bit of bad to try to win people over. It's also interesting that in the last few years, there's been an explosion in Nashville, if you do a Google research on this, with the term fireball, all right? As strange as this is, you don't see this necessarily with other cities, but with Nashville you do. For example, in the last few years, Jack Daniels had a whiskey called the Fireball Whiskey, okay? And it became the rage of Nashville. And in fact, it went from 1.9 million in sales to 61 million. And the Nashville Business Journal actually carried this headline, Nashville's Fireball Obsession, Even Grandmas Are Downing the Cinnamon Whiskey. And in their advertisements, they are very occult-like, and they talk about unleashing the dragon. In fact, when you go and you look at their websites, it is full of the occult. You can, you can see it and sense it there. And not only just in this instance, but over and over and over in the last few years, there's just like this explosion in the term fireball in Nashville. And you ask, have to ask the question, you know, this is awful strange. All of this happens at the same time that Ellen White's dream is released that talks about a ball of fire falling upon this locality. And you say, is this all a coincidence? Hosea 8.14 says, But I will send fire upon his cities, and it shall devour the palaces thereof. Now this next quote, letter 158, 1906, very interesting. So she says, The Lord calls for people to locate away from the cities, for in such an hour as you think not, fire and brimstone will be rained from heaven upon these cities. And at first thought, you say, well, maybe that's during the, the time of the seven last plagues or whatever. But it's not. Watch what she says. When one city is destroyed, let not our people, there's our people again, regard this matter as a light affair that they may, if favorable opportunity offers, build themselves homes in that same destroyed city. So here she's saying, 
The cities will be destroyed by fire from a heaven. And when this happens, let not our people go back and build homes in the same city again. Well, that doesn't sound like the close of probation, does it? It sounds like this side of the close of probation. Our time, brothers and sisters, that this is coming. She says, when it happens, don't go back to the cities again when they are destroyed by judgments of God. So the question people says, ask because when we see the time of destruction coming is also the time of the loud cry, is also the time of the latter rain. Obviously, nobody wants to be one of the foolish virgins and people say, how do I prepare for the latter rain? I give three simple steps. First, get real with God. Oftentimes, our human pride, we want to look at ourselves better than what we are, and we compare ourselves with ourselves, thinking, well, I'm as good as that person over there, but it's not true. We can't do that. We've got to go to the Lord and be in reality with Him about who we really are, which is we are all poor and wretched and miserable and blind and naked. Second, we have to make a committed decision. As we talked about the relationship with Christ earlier, to make a committed decision means you are one with Christ over anything else in the world. And if you look at marriage as an example, how would it be if two people were going to get married and the young lady says to her fiancé, do you mind if my old boyfriend comes and lives with us? That is not a committed decision. God says, He wants a committed decision. He wants a break from the world and that we are totally his. The issue with the rich young ruler is not that money was bad, but he was unwilling to make a committed decision. Number three, learn to depend upon Christ for help. Oftentimes, we are so full of ourselves that we talk about our problems to everybody around us instead of going right to the one who has the answers. Yes, there is a time for godly counsel. We're not knocking that. But oftentimes we are more into gossip about our problems than we are truly seeking solutions from the Lord. The Lord wants that intimate relationship with us where he can guide us and counsel us and direct us what we should do and when we should do it. The time is coming when, as Jesus says, you don't go back and get your coat, you're going to leave because the Spirit is going to tell you, you need to get out. Some way, those in the cities, the Lord is going to say, get out, and they're going to need to get out. We are living amid the perils of the last days. The wrath of God is preparing to come upon all cities, not all at once, but one after the other. And if the terrible punishment in one city does not cause the inhabitants of other cities to be afraid and repent, their time will come. The destruction will begin in certain places, and the destruction of life will be sudden, and few will escape. From the book of Amos, chapter 4, and verse 11 and 12, we read, I have overthrown some of you as God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah. And you were as a firebrand plucked out of the burning. You were rescued. You weren't destroyed in the destruction. Yet, even in this judgments of God, you have not returned unto me, says the Lord. Therefore, thus will I do unto thee, O Israel, and because I will do this unto thee, prepare to meet thy God, O Israel. The judgments of God, brothers and sisters, are coming upon our society. Are we doing our utmost to warn the people that their only safety is found in the cross of Jesus Christ? Are we giving the message with a sense of urgency to prepare a people for the coming of the Lord? Do we want our mansions here or do we want our mansions there? Where do we want our mansions at? There was um, some years ago, there was a family vacationing off the coast of Thailand and they were on the beach. And out there on the beach, you know, there was a young lady. She was actually from England. Her name was Tilly Smith. Some of you from England may have heard of her. And she was there with her parents and her family. And they were enjoying the ocean and the beach. And then a very strange thing one day when we were there out at the beach, a very strange thing happened. They were there and they looked out and the water was gone. There was no water. There was no ocean. And it was remarkable. And people were saying, wow, this is really strange. But Tilly, in her class back in school in England, she had had a class about tsunamis. And she says, Mother, I saw this in my class. This is a sign a tsunami is coming. Mother, we've got to warn the people. We've got to. And she says, oh, no, Tilly, don't worry. It's okay. It's fine. No, Mother, she got very frantic. She says, Mother, if you don't do something, I'm going to do something. We've got to give the warning message. 
So mother remembered, well, she did have a class about tsunamis. So they went and they talked to her father, who was there on the beach. And then together they went and they talked to the lifeguard. And the lifeguard heard the message and he warned all the people, get off the beach, get off the beach. And the people fled from the beach before the giant wave came rolling in. Tilly Smith was, cre was credited with saving the lives of approximately 100 plus people that day because she was willing to give the warning message. Brothers and sisters, God's people at the end of time, are we willing to tell the world the warning message that God has given us, the three angels' message that Christ is about to return, that the time of the judgment is now, and that people need to get their lives in order. Are we giving the warning message? The program you have just been watching is available on DVD. You may purchase a copy of this presentation by visiting www.autumnleaves.co.nz. That is www.autumnleaves.co.nz or phone 03-313-7762. Thank you. My name is Tim Saxton.